Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Seviana Analysis. I'm your host, Kero Kalmasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you, all of you guys. I can see that some of you say, thank you, Kero, for all you do. And in Arabic, we say, Hada wajbi, which means this is a duty. It's not only a job that I do. It's not only a career that I pursue, but also I want to impact. I have to have an influence over the people's opinions, positive influence let's say one of the commentators said another uplifting video about the good nature of mankind no doubt i'm sure that's a sarcastic comment and eventually the reason why i do these videos because i want to shed light on on the suffering of people whether it's in west asia or in different parts of the world in order to prevent further atrocities against them this is the main reason and the main consideration why i started syriana analysis and where Syriana, Syriana analysis will head forward, the main consideration, the first consideration is always and will always be humans, whether it be in the United States, in Latin America, in Europe, in Africa, in the Middle East, West Asia, Central Asia, Far East Asia, and all the continents of the world. I truly hope that one day we can all coexist together. I don't have much hopes about that because I know that the nature of the people who usually come to power is not usually or uh, rarely, let's say, seeking for peace. So that's why we have to expose them and we have to shed light on their corruption and on their wrongdoings and on their crimes. First things first, I want to make a disclaimer because we live in a very uh, free times, let's say, in a very free environment and in a very democratic environment. This video is for educational purposes and I do not endorse the players, the state or the nano state actors mentioned during this video. And I don't necessarily endorse the opinions and the analysis that I'm going to show you so that we can together make up our minds. This is the first uh, endorsement, uh, sorry, the first disclaimer. <laughs> Secondly, guys, on Thursday, which means tomorrow, Vanessa Billy is joining me from Syria, and the Syrian journalist Hekmet Abu Khater is also joining me from France, and we are going to expose the American-backed and the Israeli-backed so-called Syrian opposition in Washington, D.C., these so-called Syrian opposition figures who are working day and night to impose more sanctions on the Syrian people, one of which I spoke about in yesterday's live streaming, and how they are collaborating with very pro-Zionist congressmen and congresswomen and senators in the U.S. in order to further inflict more pain upon the Syrian people. On Saturday, I'm going to host Jose Vega, Probably you already know him if you're from the United States or you are following what's happening in the United States. Jose is now a candidate uh, for the New York City, I think, District 15. He is from the uh, he is a member of La Rouge Youth Movement since 20, 2014. And if, if, if you have seen some of his videos, he participated in uh, several events, let's say, organized by uh, the, let's say, journalistic um, panels or political panels, and he disrupted them with the facts that he believes. He tried to expose them, and uh, one of which was after the Nord Stream pipelines and the Seymour Hirsch case. And his movement are going to different panels and events. For example, I showed you how they disrupted the event of Hillary Clinton, for example, calling her out and uh, calling her what she really is, a war criminal, right? So she's coming on Saturday, he, he is coming. I just misgendered him. <laughs> He's coming on Saturday at 5 p.m. Central European time. And tomorrow on Thursday, Vanessa Billy and Hekmat Abu Khate will be with me again on Syrian Analysis at 5 p.m. Central European time. Before we start our conversation today on the major escalation between the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah and Israel on the borders between the both sides, I'm going to play the short video that I made today, which will probably be ready at, at 8 p.m. Central European time, and I will post it on my personal X account. But for you, I always show this exclusive part, 
without the background music and the editing. But tonight at 8 p.m., I will post it on my X account with the complete video edited. So let's watch it together, and then we go. We come back to our main topics. This week, American representatives in the House and the Senate were busy with hectic work. However, instead of focusing on serving their own citizens, they were meddling in the affairs of other regions spanning thousands of miles away from American soil. The Senate approved a foreign aid package worth $95.3 billion to Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan, and other places. Billions of dollars that the United States doesn't have to war zones which will only flare up the fires of the crisis in these regions and further destabilize global security, especially considering the U.S. public debt that has now exceeded $34 trillion. So if the House approves this foreign aid package, this will be considered a taxation without representation. And the American people will fund foreign governments without having a say and how the funds will be used. So with the sum of over $100,000 dangling over the heads of American people, if we divide the U.S. public debt per capita, the Americans can expect uh, even more, even worse inflation and even worse housing crisis as interest rates will skyrocket and it will shock the younger generation over the next years. Another achievement of American representatives came from Congressman Joey Wilson. He put his bill, which is called the Anti-Assad Normalization Act, for voting. This bill basically bans successive U.S. administrations from normalizing ties with Damascus or having diplomatic relations with Damascus under the leadership of President Bashar al-Assad after they have failed for 12 to 13 years from removing him from power through the Islamist terrorist groups underground who were funded and supported by the CIA and also by the Pentagon, the groups such as Nusra Front, the offshoot of Al-Qaeda, and some even say ISIS was supported by the United States in Syria. So, the United States now occupies the oil fields of Syria, blocks the trade routes of Syria with the neighboring countries, imposes draconian sanctions on the Syrian people, pushes 90% of the people below the poverty line, and now it is going to vote to ban normalizing relations with Syria, plus bullying and threatening third countries or the regional countries in West Asia and third country companies from dealing with Syria, investing in the country and trying to help the country recover and reconstruct. So after listening and knowing all these facts, are you guys still surprised why the American forces are coming under attack in Syria and the region overall? So are you guys still surprised that the American forces are coming under attack, whether it's in Syria or in the region? especially with the fact that the U.S. is unfortunately unconditionally supporting Israel. Put all the statements aside that the American administration is asking and urging and calling and all these phrases that Israel should respect international law, that should respect uh, the humanitarian law and the humanitarian situation should be improved in the Gaza Strip and Rafah, etc. And that Biden is so mad and angry that Netanyahu decided to wage this ground offensive and the ground invasion uh, against the Palestinians in Rafah. And there is nowhere else for these people to go except that they will be expelled to the Egyptian Sinai. I told you there are state and non-state actors trying to stop this. One of these non-state actors is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a Lebanese militant group. They have a strong um, power in Lebanon. They are over 100,000 soldiers, and they have an elite unit called a Radwan unit. And this Radwan unit is an offensive force, and they are trained since 2006 on an incursion inside the Israeli territories and occupy the northern Galil. Now, since these October 7 attacks and the 
onslaught against the Palestinians in Gaza, Hezbollah and Israel were exchanging fires among each other, and Hezbollah were succeeded or managed in achieving two things. He, Hezbollah kept um, a considerable part of the Israeli ground forces and air force busy in the north in fear of a Hezbollah incursion and ground offensive against the Israeli settlements or the northern Galil. Second, the, uh, the air defense systems kept on a high alarm and a high alert all the time of the Israeli side. And thirdly, it has decreased the pressure on the Palestinians in Gaza. This was the main goal. There was uh, some sort of uh, rules of engagement and Israel and Hezbollah were cautious not to break the rules of engagement. Hezbollah doesn't want an all-out war. And Israel knows that it cannot afford an all-out war, not that it doesn't want to. So they were sending messages to Hezbollah through the French and the American, uh, let's say, um, envoys, we, who were coming all the time to Lebanon and warning Hezbollah to back off from the borders because what Hezbollah managed to do, they they managed to uh, expel around 200,000 Israeli settlers or citizens from the northern Galil to other places because of the fires and the rockets falling in this area. So the Israelis evacuated and they went into other regions. And this has... Um, increased the military security, economic, financial burden on the Israeli government. So they are threatening to invade Lebanon uh, and wage ground offensive against Lebanon to kick the Hezbollah forces out of the region from southern Lebanon. They are saying that Hezbollah must withdraw to the north of Litani River. In my humble opinion, that's not going to happen at all. Hezbollah will reject all these demands and they will continue firing against uh, the Israeli forces until a ceasefire is reached in the Gaza Strip. And what happened today proves this argument, in my opinion. And today there was a major escalation on the borders between Israel and uh, Lebanon. And this title goes, Hezbollah launches unprecedented attack on northern Israel. At least one Israeli soldier at now, it's, there are two Israeli soldiers were killed and several were injured on the 14th February after rockets from Lebanon landed uh, in the northern occupied city of Safat. I'm going to show you this video. This is from inside of an Israeli base in Safat. And one of the soldiers of the Israeli forces is recording it. So apparently two soldiers from the Israeli forces were killed, and one of which is a woman in this um, uh, base, military base. Several rockets were fired from Lebanon towards several Israeli sites, including the Meron Air Base and the Israeli Northern Command Headquarters in Safat, Hebrew media reported. A rocket directly hit the Northern Command site. Several Israeli media outlets refer to the attack as unprecedented and the largest and most serious since fighting erupted on the Lebanese border in October. Knesset member and former finance minister Avigdor Lieberman said the red line has turned into a white flag and the Israeli war cabinet has caved to Hezbollah and lost the north. When he says lost the north, which means that they lost control over the north in the sense that they are unable to restore uh, the stability to the north and allow the settlers or the Israeli citizens to come back to northern Israel. And this is something very significant, guys, because the Israeli state is based on the notion that it's a safe haven for the Jewish people. So they come from all around the world to Israel and they have the birthright to get a, uh, Israeli citizenship and a passport and live in Israel. But the idea of Israel is that we present and we offer you safe haven and safety in Israel. And when the Jewish people or the Israeli people lose this important uh, the most important factor, and that is security, the idea of Israel, of a safe haven for the Israelis or the Jewish people, collapses, right? So this is what the Hezbollah side, in my opinion, is doing. They are psychologically 
playing with the Israelis and with the Israeli government, keeping the north unstable, not opening an all-out front against against Israel, but at the same time uh, keeping the pace of the military hostilities to a certain extent that nobody can return to the north from the Israeli citizens, and at the same time the war would not expand and become a wide-range, let's say, regional war. So, the attack, guys, uh, by Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah, he said, quote, whoever threatens us with expansion of the war, we threaten him with expansion as well. The resistance leader vote Hezbollah would not stop fighting until the war in Gaza was brought to an end. He also rejected the recent proposals made by Western states, including France and the United States, to de-escalate the southern front against Israel. Just to give you a context, guys, about um, the, the locations of these attacks, right, that Hezbollah today conducted in sight of Israel. So if we zoom out a little bit. This is Syria. This is Lebanon here. And those are the Israeli territories. This is the West Bank. This blue area is the Golan Heights that Israel occupies from Syria. And as you can see, this is Safat. And this is the areas that were hit uh, with precision missiles. And the Israeli air defense systems, or what is called the Iron Dome, failed to intercept them First, to detect them, fail to detect them, and to intercept them. So the Hezbollah attacks were uh, successful, and they managed to hit these places. This, as you can see, they are true locations in Safad, and this is the uh, the headquarter of an Israeli military here. So, on, it, as a response or in retaliation, or the Israeli side bombed several places, as you can see in southern Lebanon, and I have seen like. There's so many of them. Actually, it's uh, it's the I haven't seen this much of airstrikes in one day on Lebanon. So the Lebanese side is also now encountering major escalation from the Israeli side. And this is the video that I saw today. Uh, I think this is from uh, alarabi.com channel. And this is a footage from southern Lebanon after uh, an Israeli airstrike there. Yes, Ali, we are following you. And you are talking about these pictures from the Lebanon city in the Gulf of Lebanon, which we saw earlier. It is clear from these pictures, the size of the Gulf of Lebanon, the size of the Gulf of Lebanon, the size of the Gulf of Lebanon, المواقع على ما يبدو أن هذه الغارة في وسط هذه البلدة في أماكن سكنية وبيوت سكنية الصورة واضحة تماما كذلك تصل الأخبار تباعا حسب مراسل العربي علي رباح الذي يؤكد أن سلسلة من الغارات شنت على مناطق مختلفة في عمق الجنوب اللبناني في بلدات جبشيت وعدشيت والصوانة وإجباع وشهبية وبصلية في كذلك في اقليم التفاح هذه الغارات لا زالت متواصله وسط تحليق مكثف لطائرات الاحتلال في البلدات الجنوبيه بعد So I watched several videos and uh, this is the only video that I could show you because it doesn't include any graphic content you know there are certain rules that I have to abide by when I am showing you uh, any footage for YouTube's uh, own own policies. And um, now, guys, I divided the political and geopolitical analysis into three parts. And I will start showing you three opinions about what happened today. One is from uh, Amal Saad Reyeb, Dr. Amal Saad Reyeb. She is a lecturer in politics at Cardiff University. Secondly, it's Ali Hashem. He is a senior journalist for Al Jazeera working in southern Lebanon. And the third opinion is by Elijah Maginier. He is a, a senior war correspondent a veteran correspondent, and he's a geopolitical analyst, and he was our guest on Syrian analysis multiple times. And you will see that these three experts, um, they agree on some points, but differ on some points. And I think that's a that's very good thing because we want to enrich uh, this channel with more analysis and more perspectives. And then you can decide, guys, which one makes more sense for you. However, personally, I would like to start with Am- Amal Saad Reyeb, uh, analysis in this regard. I consider her one of the best analysts and experts on Hezbollah. 
Uh, she says, there are several messages behind Hezbollah's qualitatively different strike on Safa this morning, which Israel is treating as the gravest attack since the start of the war, with Ben Gavir calling it a declaration of war. At the forefront is Hezbollah's message that it won't capitulate. At the forefront is Hezbollah's message that it won't capitulate to Israeli and Western demands that it seize hostilities across the border, as per Nasrallah's speech yesterday. It's also a response to several Israeli assassination strikes in South Lebanon, reaching as deep as Sidon. By the timing of this escalation, also appears to be related to Netanyahu's scoopering of the Paris ceasefire proposal and his government's threats to invade Rafah, which in turn would make a full-out attack on Lebanon more likely. Hezbollah is giving Israel a taster of the type of strikes and casualty tolls its military will have to bear should Netanyahu continue to reject a ceasefire. So, according to uh, Dr. Amal Saad Rouveyeb, the escalation of Hezbollah, usually the escalation happens from the Israeli side, right? And this is a new for us that Hezbollah is the party initiating to escalate and not Israel. So it's divided into two parts. The first part is due to the uh, Netanyahu government's rejection and refusal for a ceasefire in Gaza and determination to go to Rafah wage a ground offensive and invasion of Rafah, which means thousands of Palestine, more Palestinians will perish and get murdered in Rafah. So this escalation is in parallel with the escalation in Gaza. Two, and that is also very important, is a response against the Israeli violation of the Lebanese sovereignty in the past and the assassinations of whether Hezbollah figures or the Hamas figure in uh, southern Beirut, this was a few weeks ago. So they are, let's say, divided into two objectives. And I think, my, in my personal opinion, that this escalation from the Hezbollah side was a clear indication and a message, especially to the French and the American envoys, that they, are, they will not leave the borders and uh, evacuate to the north of Litani River, and they will continue their uh, operations against the Israeli side as long as Israel continues its onslaught against the Palestinians in Gaza. And something here, like, you know, these people who call for Hezbollah to withdraw from southern Lebanon or from the borders to the north of Litani River, I truly ask myself if they know anything about Lebanon or if they know anything about Hezbollah, because... The people who are fighting, the soldiers of Hezbollah, who are they? Do they come from the moon? Do they come from the galaxy? Do they come from Mars? They are uh, the people of the of these villages. So the Hezbollah fighters who are shooting now against Israel, they are the indigenous people of the area that they're fighting in. For example, if there is a unit of Hezbollah fighters called A, and they're fighting, let's say, in a town uh, near the borders between Israel and Lebanon, the soldiers of this unit are uh, indigenous people of this town. They are the people of the town. <laughs> they're not like some aliens coming from other countries. So asking them to evacuate means you're asking them to leave their homes and their villages and their uh, places in this area to, and go to some other place. And it's not going to happen. This is just, in my opinion, it's not going to happen. And Hezbollah has established a, a balance of terror against uh, Israel and a deterrence against uh, Israel. And in my opinion, it has an upper hand in this equation now. So Israel cannot force Hezbollah to withdraw and all this diplomatic talk from and offers from uh, whether the Americans or the French will fail. Now, we have Ali Hashem from Al Jazeera. Ali says this morning attack on Safad by Hezbollah marked the most significant attack since the war's onset. Key observations include some of the rockets travel exceeding 15 kilometers without interception by the Iron Dome, their accuracy in hitting precise targets, and the impact of single strike resulting in at least one killed and seven injured. So, according to this map that Ali Hashem published, there were one, two, three, 
four, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten strikes from Hezbollah, and the ten missile strikes that happened were all precision guided missiles, and all of them hit their targets, and none of them were intercepted or detected by the Ivan Dome. And this is very strange, in my opinion, what happened today um, with the Israeli side. And he continues saying, the moving the moving sailing of the war between Hezbollah and Israel seems to be escalating from its edge. Depth is an important criterion, but the number of civilian casualties on the Lebanese side and the severity and precision of Hezbollah's strikes on the Israeli side all indicate that the third Lebanon war has seriously started looming. This is an important point, guys, that happened. I think the social pressure on Hezbollah will increase after today's Israeli airstrike against the Lebanese villages. Of course, in my opinion, they killed some Hezbollah fighters, but the Israeli bombardment is always like there is no time that Hezbollah, uh, sorry, Israel bombs a target in Lebanon or Palestine without killing civilians. It never happens. It's like uh, sometimes I have the perception or the conviction that they do it on purpose. And this was something that was adopted in 2006 war. It was called the Dahia Doctrine. So the fight between Hezbollah in 2006 and the Israeli side was in southern Lebanon, not in Beirut. Beirut is far away from southern Lebanon. But Israel wanted to punish the supporters of Hezbollah. So they started bombarding heavily southern Beirut, where the it is um, highly populated by the Shia people, the Shiites, and killed hundreds of civilians in Dahye, which is in English called Southern Beirut, to just punish these people. So this is, in, in my opinion, the same thing. Now, what's happening in Southern Lebanon, they're not only trying to target the Hezbollah fighters, but they want to target their families, they want to target their children. And today I saw uh, another photo of a killed baby, like not even a few months old, man. Like, and always I ask myself, like, what is the red line? You know, where is the red line and what is the red line for Israel? And I don't think there is a red line. So they have an upper hand in this. And and I will show you a video of, uh, uh, of course, uh, John Kirby, who proves that there is no red line. This was yesterday. Take a look. Thank you, Kareem. Um, Admiral, you've been asking Israel to avoid killing uh, Palestinian civilians from this podium many times. So I'm going to share the statistics with you. On day one, there's 198 people were killed. On day 128, 117. So on average, it's 100. So either Israel not listening to you, or they believe there are no consequences. So which one is it, or is it both? You have to, look, I'm not going to speak for Israeli military operations. Nadia, you know that. No, no. You speak for the Israeli military. I'm asking for you because you defending the point of view always that no civilian should be killed. So the number has never been reduced. It stayed steady all the time. So I'm asking you as the president. Whoever is uh, the White House is message to Netanyahu who defies every democratic president, whether it's Clinton, Obama, or Biden. And you know that this is a fact. Do you think that they're not listening to you or they believe they can get away with it? So as what the, pressure are you putting on? That's my question to you. As the president said yesterday, too many uh, of the uh, many thousands of people killed in the Gaza conflict have been innocent civilians. Too many. And we have been very, very clear about our concerns with our Israeli counterparts about that. Um, and I, I can't verify the specific numbers that you're giving me, but I also am not here to refute them. Too many is too many. Um, and that's why we're going to keep working with our Israeli counterparts to, to do everything we can to get them to reduce the number of civilian casualties. And they have been receptive. I, I, I understand that, that, that there are still civilian casualties, and that's unacceptable. But they have been receptive to uh, our messaging. They have been receptive to our ideas and our perspectives in the past. And we're going to keep uh, doing everything we can to, 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 get, to, to get those numbers down. Guys, can you imagine that uh, you're in the place of John Kirby and every day or every two days you have to go to a press conference and you're like, ah, oh, not again, you know, like, like you can't, like you don't have, you shouldn't have the face to go and uh, how can you, do, uh, how can you do a press conference with a straight face, right? It's a really difficult job. 
for John Kirby, but uh, he's not doing it brilliantly, and everybody can see through the hypocrisy of the United States. He's not a really good uh, manipulator and a good liar, and everybody understands. Like, ah, uh, we uh, we cannot like. I'm not in a position to tell uh, Israel what to do, but then here get uh, receive another a few billion dollar military aid from us and all these weapons will fall over the heads of the Palestinians, right? Yes, the world is watching the genocide and nobody stop it. That You're correct on this. Uh, this is the bitter truth, right? And uh, as uh, Melissa Manning says, Orwellian. And these people's job description is to manufacture consent about the atrocities that the United States and its allies um, commit around the world. Now I will move with you guys uh, to the third um, expert's opinion, Elijah Maginier. He says, I shared with Al Jazeera my view that there will be no further escalation in Lebanon regardless of the current exchange of bombs because while Netanyahu wants a long war, he cannot afford a million internally displaced Israelis if he expands the war north of Litani versus Haifa. So unlike the previous experts, Elijah believes that Netanyahu will not expand the scope of the war in Lebanon because he cannot tolerate uh, another one million internally displaced Israelis if the war expands north of the Litani River in Lebanon versus Haifa in Israel. He says Israel has moved tens of thousands of troops to the Lebanese border out of fear of a Hezbollah breakthrough, not to launch an invasion from Lebanon. For any invasion, it needs ammunition money to cripple its economy to count on the closure of the Mediterranean and over one million internally displaced Israelis. I am not 100% sure if I agree with him. I respect his opinion. He's a very respected uh, senior retired co war correspondent, a veteran, someone who, who was in war zones for 35, 36 years. So, of course, he knows way more than I know. But personally, I think that the Netanyahu's, uh, Netanyahu's uh, intention to expand the war in Lebanon exists, and he has the intention. And this is correlated to what's happening in the Gaza Strip. His inability to uh, achieve the major goals that he set so high in the Gaza Strip and his, uh, the, the internal crisis that he's living in and his willingness to bring in the United States and invite the United States to intervene directly in this conflict, those are factors that we have to take into account because, uh, guys, we have to remember that not always uh, sane people make decisions and there are always a margin of miscalculations and also there are decisions made by politicians uh, out of desperation. And I think that Netanyahu's position is very, very dire. And first, he couldn't um, destroy Hamas's backbone in Gaza yet. He couldn't liberate the hostages that he promised his people. And three, he the, the mounting international pressure against him and the accusations in the ICJ against his country, this, those are all unprecedented. And if Netanyahu is... Uh, desperate enough that he knows that he's not going to achieve his goals in Gaza and he wants for the Americans to intervene, then he will open a new front against uh, Lebanon. This is just in my humble opinion. However, Elijah Maginier was today on Al Jazeera English and he gave his perspective about this case and I will show you what he said in this regard. Let's now bring in Elijah Maginier. He is a military and a political analyst. He joins me now from Brussels. Elijah, as Zaina was just saying, up until this point, this had all seemingly been carefully calibrated. It was within the rules of engagement. Has that now been broken? And if so, where does this end? Yes, it has, because we have seen several hits north of the Litani River that the Israelis are asking Hezbollah to withdraw behind the uh, Litani River. So Israel is hitting several villages that are considered uh, very sensitive, like Nabati, like Jibshi, and it is also hitting other villages that has not been hit before. So it is an escalation, and I think Hezbollah will respond 
by the same intensity of the bombardment, but without enlarging too much the war. And what I mean without enlarging, it means respecting more or less the limit of the engagement, but not going into an all-out war, and which is not also in the interest of the Israelis, because then if they go to villages like Tyre and Nabatigi, they have to include Haifa on the other side, and we're talking about one million Israeli becoming refugees. Not to mention wars on multiple fronts. Let me ask you about timing, Elijah. This, as we say, appears to be an escalation, just as Israel is also planning its ground offensive in Rafa. Sh should we read anything into that? Well, the war in Rafa is really decision. It is not going to increase the battle on the Lebanese front, but it is going to increase the battle on other fronts, like in Yemen and Iraq, where the both members of the axis of the resistance will escalate further. But again, it's Netanyahu who really need to remain in this war, to go and attack Rafa, and after that, to go on the, around the negotiation table. He, if he stops, the only thing that he has achieved now is only to destroy Gaza. But he has not deterred Hamas, he has not defeated Hamas, and he knows he can't release all the prisoners by military means, regardless of the release of two only prisoners out of 131. So again, Netanyahu needs to stay in power. And for that, it is in his intention and his uh, advantage to remain in a state of war against Rafa, against Gaza, and also against Lebanon, but within certain measure that it doesn't go out of his control. Let me press you a little bit, Elijah, on, on what some of the other powers are thinking. You mentioned that you, you don't see necessarily an escalation because of Rafa on this border, but you potentially see that elsewhere. So what is Tehran's calculus then here on the Lebanese border? Is this about solidarity or is there a broader strategic objective? It is only solidarity and to keep a part of the Israeli forces engaged. It is not in the plan of the Israeli army to start an invasion in Lebanon because they can't. Uh, Hezbollah uh, has much more capability than Hamas, or the, the borders between Hezbollah and Syria, Iran, Iraq are all available and open. Uh, Hezbollah has sophisticated weapons that have not been used so far. Israel is aware of that and is also aware that there is no way the Israeli settlers will live in that area if the war continues and escalates. This is why what Israel can do is exactly what it's doing now, but destroying even further the villages within 5 to 20 kilometers in a way that doesn't invite Hezbollah to continue carpet bombing until reaching Haifa. This is not something that Israel can afford at the moment economically, militarily, and the Americans are really in difficulty if he dragged them into another mm. front with Lebanon. So you're saying... So just to keep, it, keep this in short, guys, what Elijah says is practically and theoretically very accurate. And the Hezbollah's upper hand against Israel is uh, something serious. And Israel has to consider that. But he's taking a position and an opinion from the perspective that there is a sane person in charge in Israel and there is a someone who is rational in Israel. And I, I do not think there is a rational leader in Israel at the moment. I don't think that Netanyahu is a rational leader. I truly think that he is um, out of desperation. He would and he could go to war against Lebanon. And, and that would be the biggest miscalculation for Israel, headed by Netanyahu. And it will bring uh, the Israeli statehood and the nation to its knees. And there are certain factors that they have to take into consideration before going to Lebanon. And one of which is a report that is presented by Israeli experts in this regard, right? And this is a summary of the uh, report prepared by Israeli uh, experts. 
Vanessa Billy, who's coming to our show tomorrow, she prepared an article about it that says war with Hezbollah, the most deadly war of all, according to Zionist experts. So I'm going to read you guys the, the parts that are a little bit highlighted in a, a lighter or darker way. <laughs> a 130-page report entitled The Most Deadly War of All. The report includes the opinions of over 100 experts and Israeli occupation forces commanders who describe the Zionist inability to strategically manage a multi-front war based on three-year research. So... The risks of escalated confrontation with Hezbollah are high, according to the experts that contributed to the report. Hezbollah is capable of launching between 2,500 to 3,000 missiles per day, a combination of long-range precision guided missiles and unguided rockets. Barrages would be launched toward specific targets that would include vital Israeli occupation forces, bases, or major cities. These attacks would result in thousands of casualties and widespread panic among the illegal settlements already decimated in the northern occupied territories as an estimated 200,000 have fled the daily Hezbollah attacks already. According to the report, there is potential that Hezbollah could destroy the Iron Dome air defense capability to respond by launching salvos of precision missiles, cruise missiles, drones to overwhelm the air defense and destroy their batteries. Precisely the Zionist tactic deployed against Syrian air defense systems since 2012. Hezbollah has the capability to severely hamper Zionist air force operations by targeting runways, warplane hangars and critical infrastructure with guided missiles. The Zionist military superiority depends on the air defense and the air force with both sectors degraded. The superior ground force is Hezbollah. The report also details the drone warfare that Hezbollah would launch. Swarms of Iranian manufactured suicide drones would have the potential to strike strategic military and infrastructure targets in the depth of the occupied territories. The report notes that Hezbollah's elite about one force poses a considerable a considerable threat to Zionist security and settlement stability. An invasion of these forces into the occupied territories would distract the Israeli occupation forces from a ground invasion into southern Lebanon. There would also be severe disruption to daily life, and there is already a lack of belief in the Zionist regime ability to to or desire to ensure the safety of civilians after the lack of developments on the release of the Gaza-held prisoners taken on the 7th of October. The much vaunted air defense and air force invulnerability that the Zionist settlers depend upon to ward off any intensive Hezbollah military activity would be proven another in a long list of paper tiger illusions. This would create panic and the eventual exodus of Israel from Israel, particularly by the huge number of dual nationality citizens. Those trying to flee will find their exit route blocked with the closing of airports and transport hubs due to Hezbollah attacks. The report highlights that Hezbollah is not isolated. The danger is that all groups from across the region would be involved in the military operations from the Palestinian resistance groups to Ansarullah in Yemen, the Islamic resistance in Iraq and Syria and Iran. Foreign Affairs Minister Faisal Muqtad recently announced the potential for a Syrian response to Zionist unlawful aggression against Syrian infrastructure. This is what he said in this regard. Just a second. Yep. So, um, according to the foreign minister of Syria, Syria is ready to um, engage in wars with uh, Israel. I I'm not sure about that. I, I know that Syria, of course, has the military capabilities in exhausting the 
Israeli air defense systems, its military bases will come definitely under attack from the Syrian side. But if there is an all-out war in the region and if Hezbollah intervenes directly and and, uh, wages a ground offensive against uh, Israeli settlements, then I think Hezbollah will not be, uh, sorry, Syria, Syria's intervention will not be uh, that costly because Israel will not be able to wage a ground offensive against Syria. The main consideration that we have to take into account that if Syria engages in a war and alone against Israel, then Israel will bring all its forces against the uh, Golan, Golan Heights and they can... Uh, wage a ground invasion inside the Syrian territories. But if the Israeli forces are entrenched between Gaza, northern Israel, to counter Hezbollah and the Golan Heights, I think then Syria is capable of striking um, Israeli targets and uh, achieve critical, let's say, achievements and military scores against the Israeli side. This is just in my humble opinion, guys, about this particular case. Let me know your opinion about it. I am very interested to hearing and reading your opinions because this is not something like I would say this is my analysis and it's correct because um, there are so many perspectives and so many considerations and sometimes I miss and sometimes I hit. By the way, guys, we have around 450 people watching this uh, live streaming. I can assure you that the moment I end this live streaming, YouTube will demonetize the video in, uh, until they look into it again manually. And there is a high possibility that they will not accept it because um, I'm speaking about uh, a militant group that is considered a terrorist group by the United States and YouTube is an American, um, let's say, uh, outlet. So if you want to help me, please hit the like button while you're watching this. And if you want to support my independent work, there are different means in the description below, one of which is Patreon. I would really appreciate that. So we're moving from one war situation to preparation for another war. Voila. So the British military is preparing for war with Russia. And I'm just going to play this uh, video to you while I'm reading an article from um, the Times. So let's play this. Yes, so what would a NATO war, NATO war with Russia look like? How the UK is rehearsing, guys. British soldiers at the military sea mounting center in Marchwood said they were taking part in the largest exercise in their lifetimes, Steadfast Defender 2024, which will see 90,000 troops from the Alliance carry out drills until May. The exercise, NATO's largest since the Cold War, will see nations rehearse how U.S. troops could reinforce European allies in countries bordering Russia and on the Alliance's eastern flank, if a conflict were to flare up with a near-peer adversary. Under the wartime scenario envisigated or envisigated, envisigated, envisioned, let's say, by military planners, Tuesday's scene at Marchwood would happen several weeks before President Putin launches a full-scale war with NATO because they would receive intelligence warning them of an impending attack. Soldiers are confident, I don't know who are these soldiers, that they could repeat the same task if the country were at war with Russia. Although NATO has not mentioned Russia by name in reference to steadfast defender, NATO's top strategic document identifies Russia as the most significant and direct threat to NATO's members' security. A military think tank said on Tuesday that Russia had lost more tanks than it possessed when it launched its offensive in February 2022, with the number lost is exceeding 3,000. So, um, Ukraine has also suffered heavy losses since the invasion began, but Western military uh, uh, replenishments have allowed it to maintain inventories while upgrading quality according to the assessment. So, Guys, um, this is a situation that is really serious, in my opinion. And the will Russia invade the rest of Europe? Um, 
I'm highly confident that they will not invade and they don't have any suicidal thoughts of invading a NATO country and activating uh, Article 5 of the NATO Charter when the United States uh, will use nuclear weapons and use all its force and other NATO countries will be also obliged to join. I don't think Russia has uh, suicidal thoughts of going in war um, against uh, how many countries? 30 countries, 31 countries, NATO countries. So my theory is, call it a conspiracy theory, but this is my theory, the NATO side knows for sure, 100%, that Ukraine um, has already lost the war. And they know that in a year, two, three, four, this slow grabbing of land that uh, Russia is, uh, the strategy that Russia adopted, and sending lots of reinforcement to the front lines, preparing for a summer offensive. And they're preparing for the scenario, a possible scenario, that Ukraine will lose uh, all of Donbass, Zaporozhia to um, the Odessa, and then Ukraine will become a landlocked country. They're preparing for a situation that if Russia occupies all of Donbass, Zaporozhia, uh, Mykolaiv, and Odessa, that Ukraine will disintegrate and it will no more become um, a, a nation state. It will never, it will not stay as a nation state. So if that is the scenario that even Putin hinted during the interview with Tucker Carlson when they spoke about Hungary and they spoke about Poland, of these countries having uh, geographical and historical claims inside of Ukraine, then I think if this is the scenario that they're preparing for, then these forces are prepared to go to Western Ukraine to keep it in the hands of the NATO countries and then probably... Um, incorporate them and integrate them into the countries of Poland and Hungary and probably Romania. I'm not sure, but this could be the theory. This could be the main reason and consideration behind it. Of course, they're not going to come and tell the American people and the European people that all the tax money that you paid and tens of billions of dollars and euros that you sent to Ukraine were just like that, they were ineffective and Ukraine didn't win this war and the leopards and the howitzers and all the beautiful weapons that we sent there only led to the killing of hun- hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians and they don't have a manpower to continue. They're not going to tell the truth, right? This is just in my opinion. I think they're, they're preparing for the worst case scenario, which is the disintegration of the Ukrainian armed forces and Ukraine as a nation state. And one of the articles that may prove this point is this, published yesterday on in the Business Insider, says things are going badly for Ukraine, really badly. And I'm just going to read a few parts. The Senate on Tuesday passed a $95 billion emergency defense aid bill that could help Ukraine, but the bill will now need to go to the House of Representatives, where Republicans are expected to seek to block it. In the meantime, Ukrainian troops are having to restrict their ammunition use and in some parts of the front line are being outgunned 3 to 1, Bloomberg reported recently. U.S. supplied guns such as the Howitzer are falling silent near Bakhmut, a city that has been the site of months of brutal combat because of shell shortages, CNN reported. Personnel problems are also growing among the core disagreements between Zelensky and Zaluzhny was recruitment, with the former military chief claiming Ukraine needed to massively boost the number of people being drafted into the military while the president was concerned about the impact on already fragile national morale. These challenges are creating serious consequences on the front lines. Ukraine is struggling to produce enough ammunition and equipment to meet the needs of its military to make up for the shortfall from the US and its European allies missed their target of producing million shells for its military by January. So the situation is really not good in Ukraine. And this is how I'm trying to connect the dots and try to like present a theory. And that is the Western allies of Ukraine are preparing for the complete collapse of the Ukrainian state, the armed forces, and they want to send forces to Western Ukraine 
in order to incorporate it to other countries. And uh, I don't think uh, Russia even has uh, will claim any uh, territory, territorial claims in Western Ukraine because it's a hostile environment for them. So beyond, let's say, Odessa, I don't think that uh, Russians will try to advance. It's a suicidal mission for them. But time will tell, guys. What do you think about these two cases that we spoke today, guys? I'm very happy and grateful that hundreds of people are watching me live and afterwards thousands of people are watching guys if you appreciate my work please subscribe hit the like button tomorrow i'm hosting vanessa billy and hekmat abu Khater at 5 p.m central european time to expose the american and the israeli backed syrian opposition in washington dc and if you want to support my independent work like this one i'm doing you can see the link is scrolling on the screen patreon.com slash syriana analysis and i will see you tomorrow guys at 5 p.m central european time Peace be upon you and upon your families. Salam.